So. All right. Yeah, my name is Kevin Smith. Um, I'm in charge of developing Personal Finance Lab as a product. Um, before I get started into the demo, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what you teach? Okay, well, my name is Monica Johnson and I teach, um, actually I teach economics and personal finance. I teach business, principles of business, computer science, AP, and um, computer science essentials. So quite a wide breadth. <laughs> yeah, and principles of business, so that's it, yeah. All right, so you got quite a lot going on here. There's a lot in personal finance life for most of those classes. I won't say all of them, um, but I'll get into it. So um, how did you find out about us? Let me start with that. Well, um, online, pretty much. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Personal Finance Lab, it's a platform focusing on helping teach personal finance, economics, and business classes. Um, there's three major components. The, the first one is our personal budgeting game, which um, I'll show you exactly how it works, but it basically has your student manage their port, manage their um, their budget over the course of a simulated year. Mm -hmm. um, you can have it set um, you can have it set up so the students are college students with part-time job or you can have it set up where they're, they just graduated school and are starting their first full-time job. Um, otherwise, we have our stock game, which is a real-time stock game. I'm not sure if you've ever used one in your classes before, um, with all kinds of different ways you can configure the rules to make it suitable for your class. Um, ours is set mm -hmm. up to be more focusing on building a portfolio over time, um, as if they're building a retirement account rather than doing any kind of active trading. Um, and we have our curriculum library, where we have over 300 lessons aligned to state and national standards for personal finance, economics, and business classes. Um, and you can mix and match the topics from the, the curriculum library to however would suit your classes. So I am sharing my screen right now. Can you see it? I can see it. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to log in my teacher account. So where I am now is my admin dashboard after I've already got my first class set up. Um, so I'm going to start with the class creation process so I can just kind of point out where all the settings are for each of the different classes mm -hmm. you have. As the teacher, up at the top of the screen here, you have your administration menu. That's where all of your stuff is. Um, we might be moving this at some point in the fall, but in either case, you'll always have an administration menu that has all of your stuff. So I'm going to start by creating a challenge, which should be where you arrive the first time that you log in as well. Okay. Give that one second to load. So I'll call this so you one. Went under, you went under administration and then create challenge. Create challenge. Okay. So I'll give it a name. So I'll do intro to do business. And it just has to be a unique name, uh, description. The description will appear when your students go to register. It sounds like you have a few different classes, and so um, having a good description either just helps your students know they're in the right place. Um, compared in making for economics and finance. Okay. Sure. Um, number of participants, this doesn't really impact your challenge. This is just kind of when we we're planning how many system resources we need to have. Um, I'm going to leave it public for now. The registration window is where your students can create their accounts. Um, so with a normal high school class, this doesn't really matter too much, but a lot of times if it's like a remote class or you have stragglers that come in later, you may or may not want to have the registration window open. Um, a time zone just impacts the timestamp so things can match your students. Um, we also have three other pieces of the platform for community and, and making more of a gamified um, learning experience. The first one is a forum where your students can post messages to each other. Uh, depending on the group of kids that you have, that can be a good thing or a bad thing, so you can turn it on or off depending on what you think is right for your class. Uh, badges is a system on this uh, platform where students can earn badges they can show off in their class rankings by doing certain actions. Um, so for example, in the budgeting game, if they use their credit card a certain number of times, they can get a credit card badge. Um, in the stock game, after they make a certain number of trades, um, completing certain combinations of lessons in the learning library can give you a badge as well. So it really kind of helps drive a little bit more student engagement. Some teachers just don't really want to have that for their system, so we give the option to turn that off as well. Uh, we also have a certification system where students can earn partici um, basic participation certificates for completing the curriculum. 
Um, we have one both for our investing curriculum and for our personal finance curriculum. And you can turn those on or off for your class as well. Okay, so that one is, what is that for? Uh, basically, we have if, if a student completes our entire investing curriculum or if they complete our entire personal finance curriculum, they can earn a certificate of completion that they can export as a PDF. Um, like as a class, you don't need to include all of these, but if the student goes above and beyond what you would have assigned, then they can earn that. Oh, okay. Okay. So then I would want that if they go above and beyond. Yeah. Other than that, I would check no or... Yeah, if you just say no, the students won't even see certificates are a thing that exists. Uh, I'll turn it on just so I can show you what it looks like, um, but yeah, you have the option of turning it off. So the next up is the uh, rules for your class's budget game. So I, I'll go in and show you how the game is played itself, but generally speaking, the game is divided up into months. Um, each month of the game takes about 15 minutes for a student to complete. Um, you can choose how many months it goes depending on how much time class time you want to dedicate to the project. We generally okay, so recommend. Oh, month, or you said divide it into. Just want to make sure I catch that. The game is divided into months. So. Okay. And then each month of the game takes about 15 minutes for a student to complete. So you can set it to go as long as you like. Most classes choose between 12 and 24 months. Um, we we usually recommend about 18 months. Um, you okay, can. So most most schools do, most classes you said would do 12 to 24. Yeah, somewhere in that range. Okay. Um, so, okay. Yeah, the, the budget game, you can have it open for whatever period of your class you'd like. Um, these dates here say, you know, my students can start on April, or on August 6th and they have to finish by November 6th. But you can put whatever okay. range you'd like. Um, next up, we choose our game mode. So. Do you want your students to start as a college student with a part-time job or just a full-time worker right out of the gate? Um, if your students start as a part-time worker, you can also set the game so they graduate from college after a certain number of months and then they start their full-time job so they kind of see that, how that transition takes place. Um, we generally recommend a game that lasts for 18 months and then after six months the students graduate and they start their full-time job. That way they really get a feeling of what that transition means. So when you're saying, I'm just trying to get clarity, when you're saying the, the student with a part-time job, full-time job, what's the difference? So when they're a part-time, when they're a college student with a part-time job, um, one of the actions they can take during the game is studying. Uh, all of their bills are reduced because they have roommates. This is for high school. I'm sorry? This is for high school. Yeah, but we say that the, the scenario they have in the game is they have a part-time, they're a college student, a part-time job. So they're oh. preparing to go ahead. And then you could either say that or you could just say you're starting your first full-time full job right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the other, the, the events that happen in the game, and I'll show you, there's random life events that pop up constantly. They're different whether they're in college or if they're in the workforce. Um, Oh, so this is like mock scenarios. Exactly. Oh, that's what I was again. <laughs> I was like, okay, wait a minute, we're in high school. Okay, so it could be, the game is going to be geared towards that type of finance. Yeah, this is, this is personal financial planning over a period of time. Um, actually, let me jump into the game itself because it might help just to see how it works for a student. Um, so here I am, uh, I've already started my first month. Um, I'm, I'm in as a college student right now. My goal is to complete 18 months of the game is what my teacher set up for me. Um, the stuff that I have to worry about in the game is my net worth, which builds up when I get paid and how I save. Um, my credit score, which I need to responsibly use my credit card in order to build my credit score. Uh, my quality of life. So my quality of life is a metric in the game that measures how reasonable am I being with my spending. Um, so if I just try to pinch every penny and never spend anything and try to build my net worth as quickly as possible, I'll never get any quality of life. Um, but if I do focus on you know, treating myself once in a while, um, spending some money, then I do build that up. Um, the goal of the game so is... How oh, do you like game for... I'm sorry, I just want to sure. make sure because I'm, I'm hitting the ground running. I'm going to start this on Tuesday. All right. <laughs> so um, could I do like... 
the first half of school where they are students with a part-time job and then the second half of, of the school year where they are with a full-time job? Yep, that's exactly what you can do with the transition. You would say, okay. let's say you have an 18-month game, you say after nine months you graduate, you're now full-time workers. So okay. that's what I would want to do. When I'm looking in here, my, my major goal is that I need to build up my emergency fund first. And I can do that by transferring money from my checking out to my savings account. Mm -hmm. So after I save up $1,000, and I'll do that right now by transferring $500, um, I have a huge boost to my game score. And that's, the game score is the kind of combined metric of everything together. Um, the next biggest way for students to build up their game score is by setting a 10% savings target each month and hitting it. So uh, mm -hmm. pay yourself for a savings strategy. Those two are the most important ways. Uh, the next mm -hmm. biggest way is by building up that credit score. So like I said, they have a credit card. Um, as I go forward through the game, I have these random life events um, pop up. This one is a lesson that I need to complete, which is talking about needs mm -hmm. versus wants. So these are pretty short. They're not as long as our regular curriculum, but it's just taking a personal co finance concept and making it as part of the game. Um, so the students need to answer a question correctly, which is based on that little lesson, and submit that to continue. Um, at the end of my dice roll, you can see I'm moving forward through the month, um, and I have bills that are getting issued every few days here based on what the teacher set for my class. But I have a I have a decision here. Um, in this case, it's a do I buy something or do I not buy something? Um, if I do buy something, that's usually one of the good ways to get quality of life points. I have an option of always using my debit card to take the money out of my checking account or my credit card which takes it down to my cre uh, credit card balance. So I'll use my debit card for this one. Um, you can see here I have a bunch of outstanding bills and I have alerts telling me that these bills do. So I need to go in here. I didn't pay my cell phone bill on time so I got a phone overdue charge but I can come in here and pay that off. I also see I have my um, car insurance is due at the end of this week, so I need to go in there and pay that off as well. I'll use my credit card for that one. And then as I go through, and I get towards the end of each week, every Friday I get my paycheck from my job. So while your students are part-time workers, the hours that they get at their job varies from week to week because it's not a consistent job, which makes it a little bit more, more difficult for them to plan. When they're the full-time worker, their paychecks are going to be a little bit, more, little bit more consistent, but all of their bills and all the other expenses get a lot bigger as well. So you can see I have my pay stub that kind of breaks everything out of how I actually had this occurring in my account. And then as I get towards the weekend here, every weekend the students choose how they're going to spend their time. So they can work extra hours and if the students are having a hard time hitting their budget targets for each month that's a good way to catch up. Um, socializing is a good way to build up your quality of life by spending time with your friends. Um, household chores is a good way to save money because you can do things like meal planning where it can reduce your grocery bills um, and if you don't do your household chores often enough, then you're going to start getting penalized from your landlord. Um, they'll start doing inspections and giving you fines. Uh, you'll get a cockroach infestation, for example, you have to pay that for an exterminator. Um, the last, <laughs> this last option here is while I'm, in a, uh, while I'm a college student, I have the option to spend some extra time studying. Um, this does a couple things. First, if I don't ever study, I start failing my exams and I have to pay for a tutor. Um, if I do study a lot, when I start my full-time job in a few months, I actually start with a higher starting salary if I do a lot of studying. Um, when a student becomes a full-time worker, study becomes professional development. Um, and it's the same idea. If they do a lot of professional development, they can earn raises at their job. So I am going to study, which I have an event with my friends that I need to pay for. It's just a small coffee shop visit. So that's how the game goes. Um, at the end of each month, the students see their uh, how they did compared to their expected savings goals. So if I pull up my uh, account summary here, you can see all the income I made for the month, um, my cash inflows, cash outflows, um, what my savings goal was to start the month, what I actually saved, did I hit it, and then I'll earn bonus points at the end of the month if I hit, them, hit my goals. 
um, at the start of the month, which I started in the middle of this month, but at the start of each month, the students set what their savings goal is. So they, they see what their expected income and what their expected expenses are, and they need to set a reasonable goal based on that. Um, we always have a game set up so the students earn the most points if they set a savings goal of 10% of their income. So pay yourself first, even if you have other shortfalls you need to worry about, it's always hit 10%. Um, students can also, when they start the game, choose where they live. Um, you get to choose the average for your class, but your students will have a cheaper option and a more expensive option, and the more expensive they choose is another influence on their quality of life. Um, they also have options for their TV and internet plan, and they have options for their cell phone plan, um, and they also have options for what kinds of groceries they eat. So if they want to change if they want to change apartments or they want to change their cell phone plan they can but they have to pay fees to do that um, like a fee to break their lease or a fee to break their cell phone contract uh, they didn't with their diet they can change their diet at any time they can just choose they want to eat cheaper this month there's no penalty for that uh, and you can see here my upcoming income Th these are the hours that i got assigned this month 29 is actually pretty good for a part-time worker they're getting a lot of money. There's going to be other months where they get you know, 12 or 15 hours some weeks, and so it'll be harder to hit their savings goals in those months. So if I look back at the teacher side when I'm setting this up, you get to set all of this stuff for your class. So when they start their the game, how much cash do they have in their checking account? How much is in their savings account? Um, okay. What wage are they earning at their jobs? So they'll have a different wage if they're a part-time worker and a different wage if they're a full-time worker. The income tax, 18% really just covers federal income tax, social security. If you, I don't know which state you're in, but if you have state income tax, you can add it on top of that and it'll be deducted from their paycheck. Yeah, I'm in North Carolina. Okay. Um, and then for all of the bills the students get throughout the game, you get to choose what they are. Um, they're always going to be higher when they're a full-time worker. Can you take a picture of what you have here? This, these are default, so when you create your class, this will be there already. Oh, so it'll come up and not just change it, so yes. I don't have to do it from scratch. Correct. And then oh, cool. when they graduate cool. from school and they start their full-time job, they'll also have two new bills, a student loan payment they need to make and a health insurance payment they need to make. Um, they don't have to worry about those while they're a college student. Um, you as the teacher can also con have a little bit of control over those kinds of events that are happening every time I roll the dice, where you can say, you know, this week I want to have more events on risk and insurance, or this weekend I want to focus on house household maintenance or contracts and things like that. So you, you can go in and change these settings as your class goes on. Um, at the bottom here, we found out when we first launched the budget game, a lot of teachers came in and they set very realistic bill amounts for the area they were living in, and they started every with a minimum wage. And so every student went bankrupt immediately. Um, so we give you a summary of actually what it looks like for your class. So here's how much students okay. you're going to earn. Um, here's their budget surplus or shortfall. So it, it actually works out about the same if they're full-time or part-time, what the budget surplus is. Um, it just makes it a little bit harder for them to hit their savings goals when their bills are higher. So this is all I'm going to set up for the budget game. Next I'm going to talk about the stock game. So okay. the stock game... Oh, if you run these simultaneously. Yep, simultaneously. they go simultaneously. Uh, okay, so... Okay. And you can also change the dates on it. So you can say, uh, very commonly, a teacher would say, for the first couple of weeks of the class, we're just going to worry about the budgeting game. I'm going to turn the stock game on later. Um, right. The stock game has its own dates as well, just like the budget game did. Okay. So That's probably what I would do. Well, I would do. There, there are a ton of settings for the stock game. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, but I'll talk about the ones that are most common for most classes. Um, first, um, you know, we're, we're probably going to keep in U.S. dollars, but we have the trading dates, like I just mentioned. Um, starting cash. Now, historically, most high schools would use a $100,000 portfolio. It gives students plenty of money, and they can just buy Where what they want to. That's what I was, um, I just want to make sure I, I, I understand where you this for the stock market. When I finished setting my budgeting game, I just pressed next, and it took me straight to the stock game. So it's all part of the same class creation process. Um, but we found recently with most schools, especially on the personal finance side, they don't want to give students $100,000. They want to give students $5,000 or 
ten thousand dollars so a more reasonable number that a student would actually be able to save up to start investing with and instead what we have here is our weekly deposits function where we would say every week of my class on Monday another five hundred dollars is going to be deposited into your account just like okay. in the real world if you're making co retirement contributions every month out of your paychecks so right. it's sped up a little bit because there's not as much time in a classroom but um, that's the idea so with this it means my students start with very little money as the class goes on they make contributions to it which they have to continually reinvest as if it was a real portfolio um, you can also give them interest on their cash so if you want to pretend that if they didn't invest their money it's just in a savings account you can give it one percent interest on their savings account that, that kind of thing um, we even have some classrooms where the teachers give negative interest if they're not invested because they want to really encourage the students to get into the stock game and make some investment de decisions. Um, margin trading, day trading, short selling, you know, it depends on the group of students that you have of whether or not you want to allow these. Um, most business well, classes... Sorry, no, the day trading. I find day trading... Students who day trade usually earn less money. Um, the students who do more of a buy and hold usually do better, but if you really want to drive your class engagement and have your students pay attention to what's going on, day trading is probably a good idea. Um, I don't encourage it. The buy and hold, is that the, that's the one, the margin? Uh, buy and hold is basically when a student just buys some stocks and then doesn't ever touch them. They tend to do pretty well. Right, right. So that's, um, is that, which one is that, so buying? That, that's not a specific setting, that's just a, that's just a way a students would play the game. Um, buying on margin okay. lets the students borrow money. So after they use up the cash they have, it would let them take out a loan for additional money to invest and it would charge them interest on that loan. Okay. Um, there's short selling as well. For most personal finance classes, we recommend turning off short selling unless you have a group of students who's really into it. Um, and then you can put minimum, minimum stock prices too to make sure your students aren't focusing on penny stocks. Five dollars is usually a pretty good number to go with there. Um, these other settings, do you want to have public portfolios? A public portfolio means your students can see everybody else's open positions and trades. So they can see everything every other student is doing. Um, we usually recommend against that because it turns that a lot of the students do start copying what the guy in first place is doing instead of really doing their own research. Oh. You as the teacher can always see it, of course. It's just what can the other students see. Um, now, if at any time I wanted to show it, I can go back in and make it public and then go back and change it for class purposes, for education purposes. Yeah, if uh, some teachers like to have it so their class is public for the first week or so, so everybody can see what each other is doing to start out with, and then they'll change the rules and make it private afterwards so students are more blind. Um, you as a teacher can also choose whether you want your account to be in your class rankings. Um, a lot of teachers don't want to, but we highly recommend it because every time you are in the class rankings, the students want to try to beat you and they get a lot more engaged in it. <laughs> um, sharp ratio, that's really more for a finance level class. It's, it's a risk adjusted return. For most personal finance and intro classes, it's a little bit above the students' heads. Uh, we can set how many trades each student can place. So over the entire course of your class, probably 100 trades is usually way more than enough. Uh, you can also put a limit on the number of trades per day. So we could say even though you can day trade, you still can't place more than five trades per day. Um, that kind of idea where it really restricts how much the students can be playing around with it. Uh, this last one is called trade notes, and this one's one of the most important pieces of the stock game, where that tells your students that before they can place a trade, they need to write why they're doing it. Um, why do they think this is a good idea? And then you as a teacher can review those notes later as well. Um, they can too if you want to ask them to build a, um, a presentation or a final report. They have those notes to refer to. And that's called notes trading. Yes. Uh, down here I have all of my security types. So stocks, ETFs, cryptocurrencies, options, mutual funds, bonds, all kinds of things. For a uh, Standard high school um, class, we recommend the equities of stocks and ETFs, mutual funds, and bonds. That's okay, enough okay. for pretty much everyone. Okay, you do you recommend equities? Uh, okay. And ETFs. Yeah. 
Okay. So that's pretty straightforward. You can set position limits and diversification limits. Um, so do you, you recommend mutual funds and bonds too, right? Yes, because those are those are pretty much standard things that are covered in a personal finance class. The other stuff is more for like a dedicated finance class or an in, in, in investing class. Um, the only other rule that you really need to worry about here is the position limit, because this says how much your students can invest in any single investment, so they can't put all their eggs in one basket. We usually recommend around 20%. That means your students need to buy at least five different things to use up all their money. Wait, wait, five different positions. So our stocking is also international, so it depends on the group of students you have. Were you so I can write down if you said that's sure. the position limit? Yes, position limit. Okay. So I'm going to skip all these other rules because you really don't need to worry about them. Um, and then the last part here is exchanges. So Personal Finance Lab has uh, 30 different countries that we support. Uh, for most classes in the U.S., it's U.S. only is what makes it easier for the students. Um, if you happen to have a lot of students from outside the country, you might be able to turn on some other exchanges, but it's usually not necessary. Um, and last, we're going to look at the curriculum. So we have what's called our assignment sanction. And in your class, you can set up as many assignments as you want. Um, we usually recommend doing it weekly, so I'll say week one here. And how did we get there? I just pressed next from my trade. When I finished my stock game settings, I pressed next and I came to my assignment. Um, so I'll have it start today and end in a week. Um, and then I look down here at the lessons that I want to include this week. So these first 10 topics at the top here are the things the student really needs to know in order to get into the stock game, which is kind of why we put them at the top. Um, our curriculum library is divided up into articles uh, and other lessons. So this article, for example, has a video. Um, it's about a thousand, two thousand uh, words long. It's written at about an eighth grade reading level. There's there's lots of images and um, infographics, and then it always ends the pop quiz. The pop quiz is between three and five questions long. It really just covers the stuff that's in the article above it. Um, it's mostly to make sure the student read the lesson. Um, the other activities is tutorial videos. So these tutorial videos show your students how do they use personal finance lab. So it's a, a high level of how does the system work. Um, if I get into my personal finance lessons, I also have some what are called activities, where instead of it being an article with a quiz, we give students a tool, like this is a millionaire calculator that helps them plan on how they can save a million dollars by the time they want to retire. Um, and then the quiz at the bottom gives yeah, students a scenario. Is it their own place to find it, or, or I should just give it as a weekly assignment? Is that what you're saying? It depends on how you want to organize your class. You can put everything uh, up at once and let the students go through at their own pace. Um, usually that can be a little bit overwhelming for students, so giving them a little bit at a time helps them kind of digest right, it. Yeah. Um, and, but that would let them go through it. So yeah, these are interactive calculators that say where I want to be and how much I can save up. Um, and you can see in here, I'm, I'm in my personal finance curriculum now. There's, there's about 70 different lessons on personal finance covering the entire set of what's in the typical personal finance standards. So for example, when you're talking about insurance, that week you would come in and say, okay, I want to include the car insurance, renter's insurance, homeowners, all the insurance related lessons. Um, we have guides that divide these up into recommended units depending on your class topic as well. As well. Um, coming down here, I also have my economics library. So again, all the basic economics concepts we cover in here. Um, and you can mix and match these with your personal finance lessons, however, in whatever combination you would like for your class. Uh, career prep, which talks about preparing a, a um, resume, applying for jobs, what it means to, what your responsibilities and rights are as an employee, um, how, like how to think about career development. And you're asking about the business lessons, that's in our accounting, management, and marketing um, set. So we have about 30 different accounting topics, which is kind of the bulk of it. Um, everything about financial statements and financial planning. 
We have our management section, leading and directing, um, conceptually, how do you finance, competitive building competitive advantages, th things like that, and our marketing unit, which talks about uh, sales and marketing strategies. Okay, so, so if I was just doing a business class, I can add them, the users and then just do the, the management and nothing else? Yes, you can do that. And see, I don't want them to be. I don't want them to do the stock market game. I just want them to do to learn about the management piece. Um, so you can set up multiple classes on Personal Finance Lab, and that's the way you would do it. You'd have one class set up that has the budgeting game turned on with the stock game. You have another class that has just some lessons that you want them to look at. Um, we do recommend turning on the stock game for those students, even if you don't t tell them to use it, just so it's there if they want to. Um, no, because then that kind of prohibits them from taking economics and personal finance. Yeah. So it's two separate classes. Sure, it's a, you. You can organize it however you'd like to for your your students. Then so you don't you don't have to turn them on. Okay. Um, we have a small section here called mathematics and spreadsheets. What this really is, it takes the students using data that they build through using the stock game exporting it from personal finance lab and doing things in Excel and Google Sheets with it to learn a, bit, a little bit more on how to use those programs. Um, and then our Investing 101 course. So this is all of our investing lessons where um, instead of it being, you know, we have one lesson here, one lesson there with a pop quiz, we take these and we put a, on average 10 smaller lessons in a organized chapter and that chapter ends with an exam. It's a longer exam that covers everything that came before it. Um, the Investing 101 course is one of the ways that students can earn a certification so if they complete all of these lessons. Uh, the last stuff near the bottom here is actions in the games. So you can have your students place a certain number of trades in the stock game, or you want them to complete a certain number of months in the budget game. Uh, and that lets you track the actual activities the students are doing inside the games themselves. Um, and the last thing in the assignments we want to talk about is the assessments. We have both a pretest and a post test, which covers financial literacy. And so we do ask teachers to include the pretest when they first start and the post test towards the end of their class. That way you can measure some outcomes on how effective the, the uh, games have been. Um, otherwise, that's all you need. So we're all set here. I have, um, oh, there's one last thing up here is a reward. So my students finish all these lessons, I can give them a reward. So to their stock game or their budget game account, I can just give them some extra cash as a reward for completing their lesson on time. Um, you don't need to, but you can, and it does encourage them to finish it faster because it means they go up in the class rankings. Okay, so the reward is monetary? Yes. It's for giving them stock? Yes. So I have everything here set. I click create and my class is now ready to go. So the system will give you this link here, which you give your students. This has your students create a um, account. So it's just username, password, um, their school email address, that's optional, they don't need it, and then their first name, last name, so you know who they are. Um, that's all they need to do when they to get into your class. Um, so when I would send them a link. Correct. Okay. Okay. So when your students sign in for the first time, uh, this is what they're going to see. This is their dashboard. Um, and this is assuming you have everything turned on. So you have your the assignment that you set up is here, which is has a countdown showing how long they have to finish it, along with all the stuff you asked them to do. Um, they don't have anything in their stock game uh, portfolio yet, so they have some ideas of how to get started. Um, their budget game is empty, so they have to start building that up as well, and they can see where they left off the last time they played. Uh, as the teacher, you can also post announcements. So the announcements are right here. It goes in, and um, you can post messages to this whenever you want to. You can embed YouTube videos or put links or whatever you'd like to communicate to your students. Um, and then this is where I see my badges that I've earned as a student. So like I said, as I'm playing the game, I can earn various badges for different activities. I've earned a bunch already because I've been on here for a while. Um, but they see their progress of where what badges they can still earn as well. Um, 
in the stock game, I did show you the budget game a little bit, but I'll give you a little primer of the stock game too. So this is how a student goes to make a trade. Um, they start typing a company name, uh, and it'll give them the list of symbols that match. So I'm going to trade Apple, and I can see Apple's logo here. I can see its prices. I have a chart showing its performance. Uh, if I scroll down a little bit, I can see the you know, description of what this company is and what they do. Uh, I can see analyst ratings. What, what is Wall Street saying about this stock? Um, for business classes, I can even see financial statements for this company going back 20 years. Um, I get a detailed price history that I can export and play around with. Um, and a detailed quote with a lot more financial information if I want to do some more research. Um, when I want to make my first trade, I put how much I want to buy. And then before I can place my trade, I need to write why I'm doing it. So this is the trade notes that we were talking about earlier. Confirm it, place my order, and it is now in my portfolio. So this is my portfolio. Um, let me actually roll back to an older class so I can show some one that I already built. Uh, all the stocks that I'm holding, um, I can look at them as, this is what we call the, the list view, where it just shows all my holdings, but we can also do a chart view that shows how my stocks have been moving over time. Um, and these are color-coded, the green ones I'm making money, the red ones I'm losing money. Um, I also have other reports that I can view, like uh, my transaction histories, or the most popular one, of course, is the class ranking, showing how I'm doing compared to everybody else in the class. Um, the students also have a bunch of reports for their budgeting game, so they can see their overall progress. They have uh, banking statements for their checking account and savings account. Uh, they also have credit card statements, and they can export all this information as well. We, tr we do our best to try to make it so it's as, reason as realistic as possible compared to what they'll see in the real world. Um, otherwise, yeah, there's, uh, I can see the certificates that I could earn and what my progress is towards them. So I have a little bit of progress towards my financial literacy. I haven't gotten anywhere for Investing 101 yet. We have tons of tutorial videos to help students get started with every piece of the site. Um, our learning center has all kinds of extra lessons, even be of a, above and beyond what you assign to your students. They, they can find more of the um, lessons in here as well, as, long as, as well as a complete glossary. Um, as a teacher, um, like I said, all of your stuff is up here in the administration menu. One of the most important ones is admin resources, where admin resources kind of goes through in detail what we've been talking about here. Um, and it also has some extra lesson plans and help to create your classes. Um, but the next most important one is the reports. So this is where you'll find all of your teacher reports. All the activities okay. you've been doing. I'm sorry? It was under administration? Yes. So. Okay. And it was reports. Yeah. So here you'll find a lot of information about your students' activities in the stock game. For most teachers, the report they end up using the most is the one that's called registration file. And they use this one the most because this is the report that will let you reset your students' email address or uh, usernames and passwords if they forget them. Um, otherwise, useful reports um, for the average class is there's a team report. So as part of the stock game, you can group your students into teams where they build a portfolio together. And you can do that with the teams tool. Uh, after your students register, you would just create the team names and you would move your students into those teams and then they're sharing a portfolio together. Um, and you can build custom reports as well. Yeah, and teams are also something that's unique to our stock and compared to anybody else. You can still see what every single student is doing, but they're working together to build a portfolio for, as a group project. Um, and this last one here is custom reports, where you can build the exact report you want to see um, with all of the fields that you want to have for your class. This is the one that most teachers end up using in the long run. Um, the only thing that's not in your main reports is the assignments themselves. That's a different item under administration called assignments. This one, you can view the assignments you've created for your class. You can create a new one. So you can create as many as you want for your class that cover whatever range that you'd like. Um, you can edit your assignments after you created them to add or remove stuff if you want to. Um, and you have uh, your progress reports for your class, which show how many of your students have done what. Um, we're actually upgrading this report right now where you're going to get a little, a little more granular information, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, and generally speaking, that covers pretty much everything. Do you have any other questions for me?
<laughs> All right. All right. Um, so I guess I just got to jump in there and how many users do I have? Your school has 85 students per year. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, I do thank you. Um, so if I have any questions, do I just contact you? Um, the main person you'd be contacting is Anthony Ponzo, uh, aponzo at stocktrack.com. He'd normally be here right now. He's on vacation this week. Um, you can also reach out to me, uh, ksmith at stocktrack.com. I'm happy to help as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Right. Have a good weekend. Yep, you too. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.